Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Memorial Day weekend. So great to see all of you today. Hey, if we've not met before, my name is Christian Smith. I am one of our online campus pastors at the Life Christian Church. I am normally stationed in London because I'm studying there. However, our lead pastor, Terry Smith, if you haven't heard, is on sabbatical uh, just starting a couple of weeks ago, actually. And so I'm here for a few weeks, and we'll have some other wonderful pastors who will be here serving you in the interim. So I'm so happy to be here from London, spending a few weeks with you guys and teaching a part as a part of our new series called Heaven on Earth. And what a wonderful job by our band in that uh, last song that they just sang. Round of applause for them. Um, and Haven Burton, who uh, led this song. I love uh, the lyrics of that song called My Father's World, specifically as it connects to our current series called Heaven on Earth, where we're talking about what heaven is, what heaven isn't, what it means for heaven to come to the earth, and why this matters for our world now and not just in the future. And today we'll have an emphasis on our placemaking within the world. And some of the the lyrics of this song read, this is my father's world, and to my listening ears all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, oh let me never forget, that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world, why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king, let the heavens ring, God reigns, let the earth be glad. I love this idea of acknowledging the world as being a possession of the Father. And it almost echoes of these different sentiments and themes that we we see throughout some beautiful passages of Scripture of things and objects within the world having this this special place in the Creator's eye, having a special relationship to the Creator. Like the song says, all nature sings. Um, this idea of, of, of the birds, their carols raise. It reminds me of Isaiah 55, for instance, which says, the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And you see these other uh, passages that speak of nature in some sort of way, some unconscious way, offering praise to the Creator by way of their beauty and the meaning and the goodness in how they are made as having been made by the Creator's hands, if you will. So today we're going to be talking about the importance of the world around us and our experience of being placed within this world and being a part of shaping the places within the world around us to make them more of what God intended for them. As most of uh, you know, and I've just briefly alluded to, I just moved to London about eight months ago with, with my wife, Amanda, who was helping to lead worship on stage. And one of the biggest revelations that I had moving from New Jersey to London was that moving absolutely stinks. Very little redeemable qualities about that process. And if you think otherwise, we'll have prayer partners that can spend time with you after service. I've heard of people who do like moving, like they get addicted to like the high of it. And yeah, I mean, we don't identify, it's unscriptural, but we'll, you know. Um, moving stinks. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing this process. I've only moved a couple of times in my life, um, but I'm also young and I don't really own anything. So, like, moving wasn't that bad. I'm too young, not enough money to own a lot of stuff. Then I got married and then you get a little bit more stuff, you know, you get starting a little bit older. And so we moved a couple of times and then we're getting ready to move to London and we're trying to figure out, like, how are we going to furnish an apartment there? Right? And so, like, how are we going to get stuff there? We're going to have to buy all new stuff for an apartment in London. So we end up deciding to get a furnished flat there so that we wouldn't, and we're like, okay, we'll just bring, like, silverware and, like, clothes, right? And then we'll go to London. And then, like, 30 boxes of books for me, basically, because that's all I own, actually, are books. And then, like, three blazers. It's pretty much all you need in life. Um, and so, like, we, we end up, like, like, getting these, like, uh, like crates. And if you follow Amanda on Instagram, I don't know if you or me or whatever, like, we, we should post pictures of it. But basically, we just got, like, these, these, these like, t- like, I think it was 12 tubs, like, pieces of luggage, basically. And we brought them to the airport. And, oh, such a confusing process. But we get there, 
And I'm like, all right, we aren't going to have to buy all this stuff. We're just going to bring our stuff, put them in the drawers of the dressers that they have for all of us. There's couches already. There's entertainment centers. This is going to be super simple. And then I forgot that I was married to Mrs. Amanda Smith. And she is the most incessant reorganizer, interior direct decorator of spaces. I kid you not, I would say once every two weeks, I like wake up in the middle of the night, maybe once every three weeks, like I'm not lying here, and I'll walk downstairs, because our apartment, it's like small, but there's, it's duplexed or whatever, it's like two floors, and I'll like walk downstairs like bleary-eyed, like, oh, what's going on? And Amanda will be downstairs, and I'll walk in the room, 3 a.m., there's like worship music on, and she like looks at me like this, like she's been caught, and the entire apartment is flipped, everything's moved. <laughs> It's wild. She's always like organizing things. Blah, 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 blah. And so I thought we were going to have to buy much for London. And then I forgot that Amanda's my wife and that like having a couch isn't good enough. You have to have like all the accessory for the couches and all the different pillows that have the different colors. And, blah, 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 blah. and so like, you know, for the first two months, I thought we were going to have to buy that much. We literally had packages coming every single day, at least one package every single day. <laughs> and this was a very real experience. I think the picture's actually bigger, and they're just like, this is, this is the, my entire life. And of course, I have to do the trash for our apartment. Like, you know, so I'm like breaking down so many boxes, paper cut, cardboard paper cuts, and you never forget those. The miserable. Yeah, so it was, what are we talking about? Oh, moving to London, yes. But the awesome thing about having someone like that in my life is I would have just like, I could have slept on a floor for three years in London, but I have someone who cares about these sorts of experiences and ends up making a beautiful apartment. I think we have a picture of like our little living room area. It makes a nice, pretty area. I did buy the flowers, thank you very much. It took me like a full day to figure out how to buy flowers. That's a whole other story that you guys don't want to hear about. But she made a beautiful, beautiful place that has finally started to, be, to, to feel like a home for us. And that's hard to find home, find a place that feels like home when you're moving and, and new relationships and all this kind of stuff. Well. What I think that, that I've realized in being there is the importance of place in our lives, of where we are, where we're situated. And conversely, on, on more of a, 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 a difficult note, is you know, as we were there for a few months and um, you know, not super far away, you have the, the Ukrainian war going on. And um, so many difficult things with events like that, with what I would... Um, you know, assumed to be the, the greatest uh, loss and, and cause of pain and hurt and concern is the loss of life that can go on in a war like that. But also this other maybe secondary <clears throat> concern, it's a little bit less important, but still very important, very, still very important, which is the displacement of people. It's almost like 20% of the Ukrainian population has been displaced, from, had to leave their homes or flee the country. or That like that's like, feels like an important thing when you're thinking about what's happening to a people group. And then if you think about this from a bigger picture of, of, of narratives throughout history of people groups being displaced, of maybe losing their homes for any number of reasons. And I think what, what we realize is that there's this extremely important and integral role, maybe not integral, but very, very important and valued role that place plays within our lives. Whereas I was finding a place in my life, a new place, so too other people are losing their sense of place, being disconnected from their history, from their memory, from their culture, maybe from their language, from their emotional experiences that they've had. See, something sticks out about the importance of place to people because people always exist in places. As Timothy Gorringe says, to be human is to be placed, to be born in this house, hospital, stable, or even as in the floods in Mozambique, in a tree. It is to live in this council house, semi-detached, tower block, farmhouse, mansion. It is to go to school through these streets or lanes, to play in this alley, park, garden, to shop in this market, that mall, to work in this factory, mine, office, farm. These facts are banal, but they form the fabric of our everyday lives, structuring our memories, determining our attitudes. How, as Christians, should we think of them? How should we think about the places in our lives, about the places in which we experience the world, we experience our lives from birth through death, and what about the eternal places as well? 
See, I believe that place, our, relationships to, our relationship to the world around us, plays an important role in our lives and is an important part and plan of God's work in the world. So that as an introduction, and last week we uh, started this series called Heaven on Earth, and we discussed how the story of the Christian life is not one of going to heaven, but about heaven coming to earth or to places. The oft-imagined eternal future of of, of uh, the Christian life is not one of us uh, living as disembodied spirits in a spiritual world for all of eternity, as we say, floating on tempur clouds and playing your harp. That is not the v- eternal vision that we have as Christians, so that's often the story that we have been told. Heaven Um, in more of a full definitional sense, exists as the spiritual dimension where God's rulership and reign is fully manifest. And the proclamation and work of Christ was the coming of God's kingdom, or heaven, to this world. Jesus did not come to teach us how we can be saved so we can go to heaven. It was about how we can experience salvation and participate in God's plan of bringing heaven to earth. And I've had some interesting questions throughout this process, uh, of which there are tons and tons and tons of them. Uh, but really, the, the, again, the plan is not for us to be disembodied spirits, but that when we die, some people, like today, which is, these are questions that you see actually throughout scripture, like in Thessalonians, you have, you have believers who are wrestling with these questions, is that Sometimes uh, uh, Christian thinkers prefer to call where we go kind of temporarily as paradise. Jesus on the cross said, today you'll be with me in paradise uh, to the person who was next to him on the cross. So that there does seem to be some persistence of self when we die today in some sort of spiritual way with God in heaven. But what will happen at the end of time is that Jesus is going to come back to the world. This sounds so crazy, but and believers will rise bodily from the dead and live in a renewed earth in which heaven exists, the new heaven and the new earth, which is spoken of uh, throughout Scripture. And so when we look at what Jesus did and who Jesus was, Jesus rose bodily from the dead in a glorified body that was different, that existed in some sort of different kind of way, is he is basically, he is the first new creation. He is the first resurrected body from which we in some way will be like that eternally within a world that is somewhat similar to this sort of world. Is anyone freaked out by the zombie story that we're talking about right now? This is, we're looking through a glass dark. We don't understand how all this works, but this is the vision that Scripture lays out for us. We aren't going off. There's something coming here. Jesus is going to bring it, and we are a part of it in some sort of way. Okay, the kingdom of heaven is coming here. Now, when we think about the kingdom of heaven coming to the world, we typically think about it in two distinct ways. We just emphasize it based upon our personalities and background. We emphasize one of these two ways, sometimes to the detriment of the other. So uh, Nicholas Perrin uh, lays this out in a book called The Kingdom of God. And uh, he says that there's a first set of Christians. And he says, the first set of Christians are those who see the kingdom of God as something falling outside of their day-to-day reality. For these, it's not that the kingdom isn't real, it's just that it's only on the inside. So the kingdom isn't kind of real in the day-to-day reality of our life externally, it's that the kingdom is something real on the inside. Such might agree with the 18th century writer Louisa May Alcott when she writes, a little kingdom I possess where thoughts and feelings dwell. Today, we hear similar sentiments when people say things like, the day I came to believe in Jesus is the day he set up his kingdom in my heart. This conception of the kingdom as a personal reality may or may not rule out a corresponding objective reality in the world outside of us, but the emphasis is on the soul, the interior life. Okay? So that's the first set that he's speaking of and how we approach the kingdom of heaven. Everyone tracking? Hmm. It's a memorial day. Hmm. Barbecue tomorrow. Other Christians, the second set, identify the kingdom not as an internal reality at all. You're not focusing on the soul, the inner renewal part of what's going on here, but rather as something public, something out there. 
Here, quite often, the kingdom becomes a social ideal characterized by certain practices, values, and attitudes, maybe political events and all that sort of stuff, things happening in society, in the world around us. We each tend to emphasize the kingdom as either being internal, external. Most of us normally have an inclination of that. Think about for yourself. Do you think of it as being this internal thing like, oh, God's saving my soul and I'm having this internal reality going on? Do you think of it as being, if the kingdom's coming, then here's external realities that are changing and taking place? What do you tend to emphasize? Either way, what we must realize, it, it, you know, we're all going to end up in different ends of that kind of spectrum, typically. We have to realize that the coming of the kingdom is both an internal and an external reality. It's not one or the other. Because God cares about all of his creation. He cares about you as a creation. He cares about external realities. He cares about systems, principalities and powers, all that sort of stuff. He cares about. And so when we expect the kingdom to come, we expect it to come holistically. And so eschatology is the study of end times and uh, and how things are going to be in the end, but it also, since the end is broken into the present, if this makes sense, we should experience some of that transformation today. And I prefer a term which is called holistic eschatology, which is that God is holistically renewing all things, not just saving this little spiritual orb within us, which sounds like a, like a dumb thing to say, but I think that's how I thought about it for a lot of my life. If I really, really kind of put my finger on the thought in my head, this little orb that goes off. No, God cares about bodies. He cares about the world. All this sort of stuff. All right? Now, um, why, again, God cares about this holistic renewal, the internal and the external, is because he cares about creation. And as Craig Bartholomew says, the Christian movement grew from an essentially positive view of the world, of creation. This is so much different than how Christianity is often looked at or sometimes how it communicates itself. It grew from an essentially positive view of the world, of creation. It refused to to relinquish the world to the principalities and powers, but claimed even them for allegiance to the Messiah, who is now the Lord, the Kyrios, which is just Greek for Lord or Master. The early Christians saw Jesus' resurrection as the action of the Creator God to reaffirm the essential goodness of creation and, in an initial and representative act of new creation, establish a bridgehead within the present world of space, time, and matter. Space, time, and matter. Through which the whole new creation could come now, could now come to birth. The resurrection in the full Jewish and early Christian sense, is the ultimate affirmation that creation matters and that embodied human beings matter. God cares both about us his, and the world around us as creations that are good and very good, with humans as the pinnacle of his creative activity, but in relationship also to created world that is good. He cares about creation that's groaning in expectation for the children of God to be revealed. He cares about the rocks that are crying out. He cares about the systems and principalities and power that that, uh, uh, oppress and frustrate the good things of this world. Now, next week, we're going to focus on on the kingdom coming within us of receiving the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, of that internal component of the kingdom and experiencing renewal, okay? But today what we're going to emphasize is the importance of the external kingdom being present within this world. Both matter. Today we're emphasizing one, but not at the expense of the other. Now, it's important for us to emphasize this external objective reality of the kingdom coming because through a lot of uh, Western world and, and, and uh, Christian teachings in the Western world, uh, as of late, we've often focused too much on this inner kingdom transformation and renewal. But it, and this is important because if we only emphasize the kingdom within us, not its intended presence within the actual world around us, then we tend to use the world for ourselves and we can abuse the creation outside of us. So, for instance, different analogy, but uh, take it as it is. Like if you're in a marriage and one person um, emphasizes their own needs and what they want in the marriage and don't serve the other person, then what ends up happening? That person just feels, the person who, who, who isn't really valued just feels like a tool being utilized and there ends up being an unequal relationship towards there's supposed to be some mutuality going on there, right? I'm not speaking from experience. <laughs> or think about like, um, uh, like you ever have the friend who only reaches out to you when they need you? Yeah? 
And it's like you only, like this seventh or eighth time, you're like, gosh, you have a lot of drama going on in your life. <laughs> When's the last time you asked me what's going on? I have things happening in my life too. Right, you end up developing this sort of unequal relationship where you feel like someone is prioritizing their own needs, which is important. You want people to come to you with their issues, right? It's not like it shouldn't just be about us. This is a mutual, doing community together, doing life together. There's this mutuality within relationship between people. And if someone just focuses on themselves, then it burns out. It, it, it can, uh, lowercase a, like abuse the situation in a sort of way. Of course, it can also be capital A abuse in, in, in the, uh, the most extreme forms. This is sometimes, in a less important way, because it's not human to human, but what we can do with the world around us, merely using it as a means to an end rather than treating it as a meaningful good thing in and of itself as a part of God's creation. As David Brown says, contemporary Christian theology seems willing to concede at most, which it's a little bit of an overstatement, but at most an instrumental or utilitarian value of the world. Buildings, for instance, are discussed wholly in terms of their usefulness for worship. Gardens, as though exercise or relaxation were the only issue. This seems to me quite wrong. And I would agree with this to a certain extent. When we only look at creation as, what, is, what does this do for me? and not as being valuable in and of itself, then we take advantage of it and not treat it properly. Now, there's a nuance here that's just a little bit of a switch for us, is that yes, in in, in creative order of value, there is a fundamental different sort of like uh, uh, value of humans having, uh, being the pinnacle of God's creative activity, it appears, and also, a creation being something that is a fun playground for human activity and work and, and beauty and the beauty of gardens for exercise, but also there's something about the creation that, that it's not just dependent on if I get pleasure from it, it's good. It's good and valuable in and of itself before God as one of his created works. Does that make sense? As a distinction, we can't just be utilitarians with it where it's only good if it's a means to my own ends. We first have to start by saying, this is good, and what joy and pleasure we're also able to derive from it while it also maintaining its own goodness. People can be good for us and help us a lot. We, we receive utility from them in a certain kind of way, but people have their own value in themselves outside of what you do for me. You matter. So they can both do good things for us, but are also good in, in and of themselves, with the human example being a little bit different, again, because it's two humans. Is everyone tracking? All right. I have a lot more boring quotes for you guys, so hold on tight. This is going to be a rip-roaring, no. We're going we're to apply all this. It won't be so obtuse as we go on. Okay, the inner kingdom, what God is doing within us, is supposed to lead us to care for the outer kingdom manifestation as well not just utilize it for our own ends. And I think that one of the key ways of doing this is through something called placemaking. Something called placemaking, which is creating environments which are reflective of God's creational desire for the world. Placemaking, something that's creating environments which are reflective of God's creational desire for the world. Okay, so there's this cool idea in a lot of different fields. Like, there's been a lot of writing on it, and I was kind of surprised that there is so much, but like within theology, within biblical studies, within philosophy, anthropology, sociology, psychology, other ologies, phenomenology, that's actually true. There's like a whole bunch of people that focus on this one topic. If anyone else has any more ologies, throw it out there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, And uh, there's this distinction of concepts between space and place. Space and place. Spaces are defined as transitory environments that you move through without a deep sense of connectedness or meaning, all right? So imagine you walk into like a, a building, almost like, like a, a warehouse that has like no carpet, no paint on the walls. Like that's, when you think of this word, it's more of like a space, not so much a place, which we're gonna define in a moment. Or spaces can be defined as something like, uh, like waiting rooms, like waiting rooms in a doctor's office or like airports where you just like go and then you wait there. It's this transitory environment that you kind of push through. Or it's like um, if you get your oil changed and you know like you get out of your car and you go sit in that side room and then they, they give you like sludge coffee that you really work through. So you have some sense of pleasure while you're waiting. And then there's like 
I don't know, Animal Planet on the TV or some random thing, you know? Um, that's, those are like spaces. They're things that you, just, they, you don't have a connection with meaning or experience or emotions to those spaces. It's almost like a holding tank for you until you go somewhere else, all right? Then you have places, which are environments which have been furnished with meaning and value. Places, environments that have been furnished with meaning and value in, uh, 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 in contrasted to a space. As Jennifer Allen Craft says, place is part of who we are. It is both a physical and social reality. While our bodies must, must physically dwell in places, our minds also structure knowledge and ideologies in relation to places. The, wor- the word place can thus be, re- be used to refer to physical geography or landscape, the community existing within a place, or the place of someone in a social group or network. It is a p- and then uh, also uh, uh, n- another quote, it is a place of, places are places of permanence, dwelling, story, safe rest, hospitality, embodied inhabitation, orientation, affiliation, and belonging. You see the difference between this idea of space and place? Space you move through in a transitory way. With place, you have a sense of meaning, a sense of history, of emotional connection. There's something about it that gives hospitality, safety, rest. Maybe there's people or community. And it's kind of an abstract notion, yes, but it, 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 it kind of like touches this idea that we fundamentally know is the difference between me, me walking into my flat in London and sleeping on the floor every night versus being married and having a wife that creates a beautiful flat. Space to kind of a place, in a sense. Or being, living in a community, and you have no friends, and maybe you're displaced from where you were, and you're, you're in that community, and then all of a sudden, and you have no one there, and that community just feels like a space. And then all of a sudden, you develop meaningful relationships and networks, and you go through things with people, and you're accomplishing meaningful things, and it becomes a place in which there's like a stickiness about it. There's a meaning. There's something important going on here in all different sorts of ways. A Dutch Christian philosopher, H. Do your word. That's how you wanted me to start the next paragraph, didn't you? Dutch Christian philosopher, H. Do your word. He talks about uh, basically these different elements that, that are a part of every space. It's a lot of different kinds of things, okay? This is really important. Sounds kind of abstract, but it's very important. That all, all, there are fi- 15 different modal functions or ways in which space exists that need to be addressed in order for space to be redeemed, okay? Here's some different ones I'll run through super quickly. Arithmetic, meaning they exist like mathematically, right? There's like literal, like mathematical elements to spaces. There's the spatial sense that you have. There's a kinematic or how things move, the mobility of it. There's the physical, there's the biotic element, like the, 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 the life source within spaces. The sensitive, the logical, historical spaces, places have histories. Um, Lingual, often a place or space you're associated with has, has a language associated with it. The social dimension, economic realities connected with places, aesthetic, how things look. What I study in school is the aesthetic dimension of places. That's what I focus on. Juridical, if there's justice in places or if there's injustice in places. The ethical, um, what is the ethic of a place? And the pistic, or meaning faith spiritual dimension of a place. You see, God has called us, I believe, to be place makers. I think that spaces are environments, not just like a room in your house, but it's not less than a room in your house. Environments, whether that's a social environment or a physical environment or a garden in your yard or all these kinds of things that most ha- that have dimensions like these of the arithmetic, the justice, the economic, the social, the spiritual, the, they all have these places. And what God is calling us to do is to redeem all of the places, the spaces in our lives so that they can look like how God designed them to look originally. And sometimes you're in spaces, and I'm sure you've experienced this in your life, in which there is injustice in this environment. And God's saying, for this to be the right kind of place for my dwelling and my relationship with you to be here in this sort of spatio-temporal world, we need to remedy the injustice of this place. 
Or we need to, God likes beautiful things. He likes to dwell in beautiful areas. Think about the temple, which was greatly adorned. And we go, God, when would this be a, a space of meeting for us? Let's make this beautiful. And you address aesthetic dimensions of space or the broken social dimensions of space. All of these things can exist in right or wrong ways or more right and more wrong kinds of ways. And what we're constantly trying to do is to work with the inner kingdom, with the spirit within us, to, to sense God's call on our lives to make places within the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his son to save the creation that is groaning. And it's not just the grand cosmic sense in which creation exists, but if the grand cosmic sense of creation exists, then guess what? Then the little particulars of creation matter as well. The social environment in your home as becoming a place of safety, hospitality, rest, justice, ethics, the economic parts uh, redeemed. You guys tracking? Does it make sense? All right. So, God has called us to be placemakers, I believe. And this is um, uh, an important theme that we see throughout Scripture, that God desires to transform, transform this world from a space into a place in which he del dwells with us. So we see this theme consistently pop up in Scripture in different sorts of ways. First of all, we start with Genesis 1. So Genesis 1, you've probably heard this before, but you have the spirit hovering over the waters. And the word water there in Genesis 1 is a synonym or could be equally probably translated as chaos. That's what water is representative of. That, representative of. So even in like Revelation 21, if you guys have, remember this, then there, it's talking about how the new heavens and new earth is going to exist. It's talking about there being no sea. It's talking about the, the removal of chaos, not literally that on the new heavens and new earth there will be no sea. I don't know if anyone's wondering that, but I've been asked that a lot of times before. Don't worry, you can sit on a beach on the new heavens and new earth. I'm kind of joking, everyone, but also probably not. All right, so you see this creation narrative, and God, the, the Spirit of God, is hovering over a chaotic space. And then what does he do? He comes, and he names it, and he organizes it, and he creates things, and he creates this place in which his creatures dwell. And so uh, Craig Bartholomew says, Genesis 1 is a place story. Genesis 1 is a place story with all that involves, and not just an earth story. It's not just about people. It's not just about the world. It's about the relationships between the people and the world with God. Those are always in relationship to each other. We are never disembodied. We are always experiencing life in place. And we are always experiencing, in relationship with God, a placed life. We are embodied beings in a physical world and spiritual world and all that comes along with that, this holistic sense of God's creative activity. And so in Genesis 1, you have this idea of God coming in place-making amidst the chaos of this space. The same thing then happens in the temple, right? So Adam and Eve then kick God out of the place that he's made for them, and then chaos reigns over the earth. And then what God's doing throughout Scripture is he's trying to redeem all of this, and he's trying to create a place where heaven and earth are joined together that he dwells eternally with his people, Right? That's the story of what's going on. Jesus as a central a a a a figure uh, committing the, the ultimate redeeming act of creation by his death on the cross and resurrection so that we can join him in this plan and process because we were broken from relationship with God. And so what God has been doing, though, this whole time is you have Genesis 1. He creates place. We kick him out of it. We don't really want him there. And he says, fine, have it. Do it your way. It's not going to work out. And then he works his way back into the world, which you've heard me say before, if you've heard me speak too much, and which you all have heard me speak too much, if you've heard me speak a few times. And then you have God who, he comes in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And it's a spatio-temporal place. And you have the high priest there who mediates the, the, this presence uh, there for the people of God. Then you have him, him come into the temple and there's a spatio-temporal, there's this placing within the world that God has. And you see this consistent theme take place over time. Now, what does, this have, what, what does God placemaking all the way back in the Old Testament have to do with, with, with anything with our lives today? See, we actually have a very important connection to this. 
You see, the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 was, uh, um, we can't go into the, like, all the literature on this, but it was seen as a temple. It was written in temple language. So there's this temple sense of the garden as being a very similar thing, like synonymous with what uh, the temple was in the future. It is a space in which God creates and organizes and he dwells in, all right? Garden, temple, tabernacle, these are all same kinds of things. And one way that we actually see this too is that Adam and the garden and the priests in the temple had the same task given to them. The Hebrew words, which are pretty much, I believe, only used for Adam and priests who are creating spaces and mediating spaces, places of God's presence. And there are these two words attributed to them, abad and samar, to serve and guard, or keeping the tabernacling presence of God, creating space. So Adam has this role to create this place. The high priest had this role to, to, to create this kind of place. But this isn't just about them, because in the New Testament, we are now called the royal priests. So the vocation that was given to Adam to serve and guard and to protect the created world and the places of this world, that was his task. The, 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 the role of the high priest was to serve and guard the places of God. There's this cultivation that's going on, but that's not just about them in the past, because today, now we have, we are the temple, the dwelling place of God in the world, and our job is to serve and guard that place of God, the places of God, so that you are a royal priest, we are all royal priests who have the same task of Adam cultivating the garden and of the high priest cultivating, if you will, the place of God within the world. But this is not just about us or keeping the place and presence of God to ourselves. As Kraft says, Jennifer Kraft, as God's image bearer and priest of the garden sanctuary, Adam was also called to spread God's presence outward from the garden to the rest of the world. The hospitable sanctuary of Eden was understood from this perspective to move out in concentric circles to the inhospitable places of the world, eventually filling the entire earth with God's presence through his people. The goal of Adam was to spread the garden, the place of God. Uh, Tom Wright actually suggests that, um, uh, you know, when Jesus goes and he like, you know, he forms the whip in the temple and he's like flipping tables and all that stuff. You guys ever heard that story? And, you know, like the money lenders and he's talking about their greed. And it's the one passage that we all quote to rationalize when we get angry, you know, and well, Jesus got angry that one time, therefore I can at you. Well, that passage, it doesn't, we, oftentimes we talk about it being about the greed of the temple and like all that stuff very, uh, seems to be true. But also, there's this sense that, that the, the temple, which literally existed, if you've ever been to Israel, as like a physical building where, where God's presence was supposed to be in, that, that, the, that the, the, the high priests and the Jewish people were using it, were kind of like barring the doors and using it as a stronghold from which to go and fight the Roman Empire that was ruling over them. But what's the goal of the temple? The goal of the, of the temple is to spread the place of God. It is this locus from which in concentric circles, if you will, God's placemaking takes effect in the world. The broken justice systems, the economic issues, the aesthetic issues, the making things more beautiful, all the different elements of, of the places is not supposed to be held within the temple, you. It's supposed to spread out and to make the world, God's creation, what it was originally designed to be. We don't hold on to it ourselves. We do not hoard the, the joy in the presence of the kingdom. We so uh, are, are enthralled by it that we want to bring it out to other people first and foremost and also the world. As Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power, Jesus saying this, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You experience the Spirit. You become the temple. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria into the end of the earth. There's this spreading of sharing God's cosmic redemption with all of creation. So we, as a royal priesthood, have to remember, I believe, that whatever place you are in, 
Whatever environment you are in, whether you are, you know, cooking dinner at your house with friends or with family, or if you're at your kid's basketball game, or you're at work, or you're going to school, or you're in some sort of social environment, that in every single one of those environments, you are a royal priest with a job, an exciting job, not a boring job. You know what's a boring job? You have an exciting job given to you by God. That's not just up to you. It's God doing work in and through you that you are a co-laborer in, but you have the Holy Spirit within you redeeming situations. God is affecting important work in you today. So in all these places, what does it mean for you to be a royal priest? And then before just the final uh, three thoughts, we have to remember that we prepare today while Jesus prepares in heaven. Jesus is, is in heaven. We're trusting that he will bring heaven to earth in the end. All things are going to, be, going to be renewed by him in the end. It's not just our work. We don't establish the kingdom. God establishes the kingdom, and he establishes it in and through us as well in different ways. We can remember from John 14 where Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So remember, in those moments where it feels like uh, our hearts are troubled, we're in broken spaces, to remember that Jesus is preparing the kingdom of heaven to come to earth in which there will be spaces that are turned into places for each and every one of us. And that provides a vision and a hope of renewal. We have to have this kind of duality where we remember today what God is doing, but we also have our sights on what God is going to decisive, decisively do in the future. All right, so we don't hold on all the hope to what's happening today because there's still brokenness and sinfulness. We try and act best according to what God has called us to do, but know that he is going to bring about victory in the end. All right, three final things. When we place make, we, first of all, find place. We find place. Yes, I think theoretically we all want to find place, but I encourage us to allow ourselves to be placed. It's kind of, it's, sometimes it's difficult for some of us to allow ourselves to be placed because when you put yourself in a place, you make yourself somewhat vulnerable. You can't have, uh, your whole life can't be in like an Irish goodbye ethic. You know, like you just like, you leave and you don't tell anyone that you're leaving. Is that right? Is anyone Irish and can tell me? Um, where you just kind of, you like, you like dip. Well, a lot of times I kind of want to live in that sort of way through a lot of my life because when you get like attached to groups or in, to an environment or place that God has called you to, will you become vulnerable opposed to how we might be tempted to live this life, which is hide ourselves and huddle in a transitory, experience the world in transitory ways as if, it, as if it's just a space and it's on our way to some sort of future thing where we're waiting for God to do something or we go off to heaven, is that no, when we, we're embodied creatures living in the world, like this matters right now, and we have to allow ourselves to be open to the experience of, being, of finding places within the world and some of the joys and hardships that come with that. So first of all, we find place. Second of all, we create place. We also are an active part of creating the reality around us. And to think of and identify your skill set. All of us aren't great at every part of the placemaking calling that God has in our lives. Some of us will be great aesthetically. Some of us will be great in terms of enacting justice and your lawyers and you're doing something in a community by, by making something a better place through your work. Or what's your task and your skill set in placemaking? And then finally, create place communally. As Jennifer Kraft says, the experience of the presence of God in place is a relational event tied to the community and actions of the people. It's not just you, God, and world. It's you and us and God and world that we're doing everything together and have to join together to, to, to pair our giftings and our passions to, uh, uh, with one another. It can't be a solo act in the work that we are doing of placemaking in the world.